CSIS 429 Operating Systems Lecture 21. Taking a look at uh, hard drives for storage. We'll take a look at uh, tracks, sectors, and zones. That is the geometry of um, hard disk drives. We'll look at how the read write head moves and how the arm um, has delays in the way it moves because these are all mechanical moving parts. And as a result, we'll need some good disk scheduling techniques, both on the operating system side, which is what we used to do, versus you know, more uh, modern disks will have uh, scheduling done on the disk itself, on the, di on the disk controller. OK, so that's a rough roadmap ahead of us. So once again, we got done with virtualization, both um, the CPU and memory. We got done with uh, concurrency, threading, multi-threading, all of that. And now we're in persistence. And we looked at I.O. devices, and now we're looking at hard drives, hard disk drives. OK, so to review a couple of things, uh, with storage devices. Uh, a lot of times persistent storage can be slow. No, it's not always. Um, there are new developments that are giving us storage devices that are getting faster and faster. But if you're talking about hard drives, then we need to consider that in the operating system design. We have to, uh, uh, we have to change the scheduler behavior when we know that slow input-output to these storage devices is involved. We can do certain things like use direct memory access, which allows better utilization of the CPU by taking some of the workload off of the CPU and you know, doing some grunt work um, using a DMA controller. So there are many kinds of storage devices each has a separate controller structure, interfaces. We can we have a rough idea of how they all work, and we talked about that earlier in the lecture on uh, I/O I/O devices. One of the main things that we've seen is that whereas in the past operating systems would actually know about a lot of the details of these storage devices, these days the tendency is much more um, to put some of that device dependent information into device drivers rather than have the operating system worry about it just because if you change a device, change a hard drive or storage device then everything changes so you don't want device specific, specific information in the kernel you want to have that specifically in the device drivers themselves so that you, when you switch a device, you switch device drivers, and you're ready to go. However, that might you may you might pay us a tiny bit of a penalty, but on the in the long term, that's mu it's much better to stay device neutral in the operating system itself. Okay, so in this lecture, we'll take a look at how modern hard drives store data. There's a geometry of the whole thing involved. What is the interface? How is the data actually laid out? That's where the geometry is important. And then how can we do some scheduling to improve the performance? So there's a lot of things we can do. And one of them is disk scheduling. That is how do you order your reads and writes and things like that and operations on hard drives. Okay, so first let's take a look at the interface. From the operating system point of view, a hard drive has a number of sectors, and each sector is a, a 512 byte block of memory. And we will look at a hard drive as just a N sector address space. So there's nothing that says we can only use 512 bytes, but that's just a standard value that you people tend to use. And we think of them, we think of there being some number n depending on the capacity of the device. 
and so these are numbered from 0 to n minus 1. Each sector is read and written atomically, that is you read all of it or none of it, or you write all of it or none of it. We can have multi-sector operations in general, so you can have data spread out over many sectors. And we will see that accessing sectors that are physically close is faster, typically. And so that's where the disk geometry considerations of how the data is laid out on these uh, circular disks is important. OK, so let's dive into disk geometry. What makes uh, hard drives so interesting as far as the geometry is? Well, it turns out a modern hard drive is made up of many rotating glass platters. A platter is just a hard surface on which the data is stored in magnetic regions using a cobalt alloy, typically. Each bit is about 25 nanometers in the circumferential direction that is uh, going round along a track, and we'll talk about tracks. So it's only about, it's, these are pretty small numbers. 25 nanometers is very small, and it's roughly about you know the same size as uh, feature size in CPUs. So these are very small distances, and so that's important to keep in mind. And these, if you haven't seen one of these hard drives, you know they used to come in uh, a lot of sizes, but typically 3.5 inch. So roughly speaking, this is about three and a half inches across and then in laptops it would be two and a half inches across so it, so that'll give you some idea of the scale here this is about just a two to three inches across and so and 25 nanometers is really small compared to the size of these platters okay so how does that work the platters and the rotation uh, there's a magnetic layer on each side of each platter and there's many platters typically and many heads but we will just take a look at one head um, look, skimming along the surface of a single platter and so that magnetic layer on each side maintains a magnetic field and that's what gives you persistence of data of course if you had a big magnet next to a hard drive you can wreck all of that store all of those magnetic fields and so you can um, erase or just at least mess up the data if you had a big magnet next to a hard drive the platters are attached to a spindle connected to a motor that keeps them spinning around at a constant speed there's no reason that we can think of that uh, uh, would allow would um, give us any advantage to changing the speed so pretty much all drives uh, rotate at a constant speed and you have to be able to do that to read data in a reliable way the rate, this rate of rotation is measured in revolutions or rotations per minute rpm you've probably seen that and if you um, although ssds are taking over you can still buy hard drives and typically these disks run at 7200 rpm revolutions per minute or 10,000 rpm or 15,000 rpm for consumer grade hard drives you typically get 7200 and 10,000 15,000 rpm disks usually go into servers but you can buy them for yourself okay so we know that there are platters and on each side there's magnetic material and so on top of that we will just from now on we'll just take a look at one side of a platter data is encoded along these rings called sectors an entire ring going all the way around is called a track so it's not exactly the same as a turntable or a you know, long playing record which uh, vinyl records where you actually have a spiral this is not a spiral it's actually circular tracks so it's a, it completes an entire circle and these that one circle is divided up into many sectors in a single platter there's thousands of tracks and so once again 
this whole thing all the way around is called a uh, track or ring I guess you could say but it's in hard drives you say track and each sort of wedge uh, part of a track is called a sector there's thousands of tracks on each side of a platter and so reading and writing is accomplished by one magnetic head it's like a small device that's like almost just about as wide as a track and it's moved by what's called an arm and we'll see how that looks so well, I'll just scroll back up and here is the arm so this is what is called the arm this moves only in, in we would say the radial direction along the radius so it just moves back and forth along the radius okay so the arm is somewhere here let's say and it goes this way and then this way and this way and so on these things rotate at a constant speed and so this entire thing this red circle or ring is a is called a track and then this this part over here is a geometric sector and this is a track sector and then you can have a cluster of sectors it's a group of um, sectors that are adjacent to each other okay let's take a quick look at how this head works the magnetic head so reading and writing is accomplished by this magnetic head and this one per platter side so when you see this in this example there's three platters and so there will be six heads one on each side but we'll ignore the multiple platters from now on we'll just look at um, one single side of one platter from now on there's a lot of interesting things having to do with how you put data across platters but let's just let's keep it simple let's take a look at one side of one platter here's the arm and the head is moved by this arm it zips back and forth in the radial direction that is along the radius there is if you look at this if you look at the bottom of this you'll see this there's this copper coil which is used to write and this is floating about three nanometers away from the hard drive so the distance between that that head and the hard drive is only three nanometers and this is rotating at um, something like 15,000 revolutions per minute which is pretty fast uh, in the early days sometimes if you if you got uh, just a tiniest particle in between the head and the platter the entire disk is rendered useless and so you have to keep this super clean you can't open up a drive and expect it to work at all um, so if you were if you have actually ever seen the platters and all that that's probably on a drive that probably will never work again it has to be super clean and people have compared that three nanometer clearance um, now this is pretty huge compared to the three nanometers so people have uh, compared this to a jumbo jet flying six inches above the ground and so that's roughly the scale these things are massive and they're very close to the moving platter which is going super fast okay just to give you some idea of the dimensions involved in the geometry okay uh, if you take a simplified look at a track although there are thousands of tracks we'll just consider a handful of tracks just to keep this simple keep the picture simple and we will say that there's a track and you know multiple tracks and it's always rotating let's say for just for now you're taking a look at it from the top and we say that it rotates um, in this direction counterclockwise okay so it rotates this way so from now on we'll just use that one direction and here we will say that this track has 12 sectors that's not always the case but let's just for simple for a, just taking a, a simplified look at this we we'll say that there's a spindle which is where the platter is attached to um, this 
uh, central axle that is powered by a motor to rotate in this counterclockwise direction. And so when you have to read a single track, let's say you're reading 0 and then 1 and 2 and 3 and 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, that's 12 tracks, you do not have to move the arm. The 12th sector might be uh, on the next track in or the next track out depending on how you structure your um, platter, your tracks. Okay, so one of the first things we want to consider is latency within a single track and that is, um, the, it's also called the rotational delay. So there are a few things that we have to consider going between tracks, be speeds for accessing sectors within a single track and that's what we're looking at right now. So let's say we, the disk gets a request to read sector 0. So sector 0 is over here. It has to rotate all the way back up to the head. So on average, you might want to read, you know, each one of these sectors are, let's just say they're equally likely to be, uh, to be read. And so sometimes you might have to read sector 3, which in this case, if your head is right above, sector 6 it will have to wait about three quarters of a rotation if it's trying to read 5 it's going to read just, it's going to need just about a full rotation almost if it wants to read 7 it doesn't have to wait much at all if it's 9 it's just a quarter rotation but on average you can see that on average you'll have to have the whole thing this track rotate halfway okay so the wait time is called a rotational delay and if you look at the time taken to go all the way around let's say that that is R the worst case delay is roughly R so that is you're on your head is right on top of sector 6 and you want to read 5 that's almost an entire rotation let's just say it's an entire rotation sometimes it's uh, lower like if you're trying to read 9 it's only a quarter on average, you'll need to go about half the, um, the rotation. And so the, the latency on average will be R over 2. You can work out the numbers by you know, looking at the units and all that. For a 10,000 RPM drive, the value R, the rotational delay, this time needed to go all the way around, is 6 milliseconds and so on average your rotational delay will be 3 milliseconds. So the average time that you'll have to wait for the data to get right under the head so that you can read it will be about 3 milliseconds for a 10,000 rpm drive. For 7200 rpm it's about 4 milliseconds that's the average delay and for 15,000 rpm it'll be smaller can't think of the number right now. Okay. So those are that those are important times. You just you don't have to memorize all of this, but you just want to, you know, see how those numbers were obtained and that'll give you a really good idea of how much time is involved in accessing data on a hard drive. Now let's take a look at the situation where you have multiple tracks. So in this case, the numbers are going from the outside in. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and then 12 is over here, 13, 14, 15, and so on, all the way to 23, and then 24 is on this inner track, and goes all the way to 35. So there's a total of three tracks, 12 sectors each, a total of 36 sectors. Okay. So suppose the disk gets a request to read sector 0, which is on this outer track, and right now the head is on sector 30. Uh, that's the, the innermost track, and we want to eventually get to read the sector 0 on the outermost track. So in order for that to happen, not only do you have to have the platter rotate till the 0 gets over here, but of course the zero cannot move in you have to move the head to the outermost track 
And so that is the seek time. The seek time is the time that the arm needs to move. And so that's an important um, quantity that we'll have to try to figure out. This totally depends on the drive. So if your laptop has a hard drive, typically seek times in laptop hard drives are about 12 milliseconds. So comparable to the rotational delays, roughly speaking. It depends completely on your hard drive. You can have some things that are have a faster arm and so smaller seek times. And some this may be rotating less than 7200 RPM and so they're like 5400 RPM is definitely um, a speed that you can encounter if you're buying hard drives. 7200 is probably a good baseline to start at. You don't probably don't no need to go slower but some some every once in a while you get cheap drives for 5400 RPM. Okay, that's going to be it's going to have a larger rotational delay if you have a slower RPM. Okay. So to summarize the delays, this is what we have. There are three sources of delays when reading or writing a sector. Seek time, that is the time to, needed to move the arm to get to the right track. Latency is the time needed to get to the right sector. So think rotational latency or rotational delay for the latency part. And then there's the actual time needed to read the sector or write to the sector. And that's the transfer time. So the total I.O. time is the combination of all three of these. Time needed to move the arm, that's T-seek. The time needed to get the right sector, to, that is the rotational delay, that's latency. And then the time needed to transfer the whatever information that you need. You might be reading from just a single sector or multiple sectors. So however much time you need to transfer that data to read it or write to it. So those three components determine how fast our I.O. is, the I.O. time. And these, you can see that these are going to be in the order of a few milliseconds. And of course, our processors these days, they can run anywhere from one gigahertz, maybe slower, but typically faster, up to four, five gigahertz. So that's very fast speeds on the processor side. These millisecond times are very slow on the disk side, hard drive side. Okay, there are a bunch of things that we can do to minimize I.O. delays. So if a transfer step involves multiple tracks, then doing something like track skew can minimize delays. So what does that mean? That means like you go from 0 to 1 to 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and then 12 is not right over there because there is a little bit of delay that you need for the head to move. And so you give yourself a little bit more time and you make 12 over here. So that when the 0 comes around, it's over here. By the time you get to 11, you give yourself a little bit more time so that the head can move and then you read 12 just in time after the head moves the arm moves and then you read 12 13 14 15 16 17 18 19 20 21 22 23 and then 24 is not right away you give the head a chance to move over and usually there's a there's some bounce that is your head moves and then it sort of bounces back and then bounces back and there's a little bit of vibration but it gets damped down, so you need you need time for that head to recover, move and recover, and and these things can be on the order of a few milliseconds. So you give it a little bit of a skew, so that after 23, 24 is over here. You give your disc a little bit of time to um, rotate, while so this the time for this rotation should be about how much time you need for the arm to move. So track skew of two is what's what's shown here. That'll allow for a simultaneous head movement and platter rotation, and this will optimize access of uh, sectors sectors 23 and 24. So if you're reading sector 23, and the next sector is certainly 24, 
then you want to do the track skew so store your data here store your data here for the next sector and so give yourself time for the head to move and simultaneously rotate that makes sense okay so when you pack data in turns out it's not just all raw data there's actually a chunk of data but it's uh, bookended by some headers a header section and a trailer and so each sector has a header and then the data and then trailer at the end that trailer has a checksum or a error correcting code it's very similar to the frame check sequence in a network um, layer 2 frame so layer 2 frames will have a header with some address uh, MAC addresses and a trailer with a checksum same rough idea you're going to read all of this and then you're going to do a checksum is all of the stuff that you got here in the header and data if you do a simple checksum calculation does it match what is written on the drive in the trailer part and if it's not then you know something happened and you can say that this sector is bad you can say you can mark that sector as being bad either try it again or just mark it as bad and never use it again so one of the things you might have noticed is that these outer tracks are longer and so you can have more sectors in the outer tracks than in the inner, tra inner tracks so for example here in the innermost track you have one two three four five six seven eight whereas over here you have one two three in the outermost um, track you have one two three six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve fifteen sixteen sectors in the outermost track versus eight in the innermost track those are not necessarily the numbers that you would see on a on a hard drive but this is roughly giving you a, an idea of how you can have more sectors the further out you go into these outer tracks and so as a result you not only have tracks and sectors you also have this thing called zones and these outer zones have more sectors than the inner ones and so this geometry gets does get a tiny bit more complicated but it's not that bad another thing to consider is that uh, hard drives do have some memory that is used as disk cache and this is just regular RAM it doesn't have to be anything fancy and it's been shown that the more RAM you have you just plain get better speed and so the idea is that rather than waiting for all the data that's written to a drive to be completely written you just write it to this RAM which can be fast and then the disk can make those r copies from the RAM to the actual platters themselves um, whenever it needs to it can overlap these operations so writing from the CPU to RAM um, and usually if you remember from the last lecture that's usually the job of the DMA controller DMA controller will take some chunk of memory from the main memory of the system and rather than having the CPU do it DMA controller can write to this RAM that can be fast and then that will be as fast as the as the uh, whatever protocol that you're using to transfer the data so there's many protocols that we can use um, and now it also depends on the on the bus speeds and things like that but this can be as fast as uh, this will be fast writing to this RAM is going to be fast and then writing from RAM to the actual platters themselves that's going to be slow that's going to be the bottleneck okay so data read from one disk sector can also be stored in that cache just in case you need that data in the future and along with that one sector you can also take neighboring sectors data and also cache that just in case they're needed in the future and a lot of with a lot of things in computer science we tend to see this um, thing that uh, we'll encounter a whole lot which is that the near future looks 
often looks a lot like the recent past. And that's the whole idea of using a cache in the first place. Chances are if you access some data now, hmm, there's a good chance you might use either that data itself or neighboring data in the near future. And so cache really helps. And it, it's been shown that the bigger you make this cache, and this is only a few megabytes, and RAM is pretty cheap. And the more you have of this, the better overall performance you have. You do have to consider, well, what happens if you turn the system off while you have stuff in cache? Well, you could lose that data. And so there's a couple of uh, kinds of caching that people use. When you write data to the disk, you can use what's called write-back caching, which says that you, the CPU or the DMA controller, actually, when it writes into the device, the device can interrupt the CPU and say, okay, I'm ready, even though the data is just in the cache, not actually in the platters and the sectors themselves. So in that situation, the CPU will think, okay, I've written it, I'm done. But if you happen to lose power right then, you will be off because you lose that data. The CPU, well, you're going to lose that data anyway if you turn it off, but that data is not being written to the disk cache. On the other hand, if you use what's called write through caching, that interrupt that says that the write is done only gets sent out when that data in the RAM is actually stored in the sectors. So this is more conservative to say to use write through because what you're saying is I'm only gonna tell the CPU that it's done when it's really done rather than write back when I'll just pretend I'm done writing but it's actually just sitting in this cache in RAM and not actually written out yet. There's advantages to both of these. Okay. Here's some uh, sample drive specs. So we're going to we're going to compare a Cheetah 15,000 RPM drive um, with a Barracuda. These have different capacities. These this is super fast, 15,000 RPM versus 7200 for the Barracuda. I forget which. I think these are Seagates, but I'm not. I can't remember. The Cheetah is fast, but it has lower capacity, the 300 gigabytes versus a terabyte. And so with the, if you look at the seek times, these are independent, RPM versus seek, but it just so happens that uh, this is fast as far as revolutions per minute, 15,000, opposed to 7,200, and also the seek time is lower. It's, so it's just plain faster drive here. As a result uh, of these speeds, you get a transfer rate of 125 megabytes per second. And the Barracuda is got, has, has a lower revolutions per minute, 7200 RPM, and a slower arm, 9 millisecond seek time. And as a result, it's got, uh, um, this is dependent mainly on the RPM, so it's got a 105 megabyte per second transfer rate. Both have four platters. They have a cache that's uh, different. Uh, Cheetah has a smaller cache and than the maximum available for the Barracuda, which can be 32 megabytes. The connection to the to the motherboard is using SCSI here and SATA here. SATA is, tends to be more um, common these days, although. Um, actually, when you say 7200 RPM Barracuda with the SATA drive, that is a few years old, so it's you're likely to see bet better performance these days. But just to give you some idea of these, these are the typical numbers that you might run across. So the time for transferring a 512 byte sector, in the case of the Cheetah, is 512 bytes divided by 125 megabytes per second and you can work out the math it'll turn out to be about four microseconds for the transfer time so remember there's three things involved in the time needed to transfer IO 
the rotational delay or latency, the seek time, which is the, the arm movement, and then the transfer. The transfer in this case for a single sector is much smaller, four microseconds, as opposed to four milliseconds for seek time, and, and uh, it'll probably be around three for the average rotational delay. So three and four milliseconds for these delays, transfer rate for a single sector is much, much smaller. Just to give you a rough idea of the times involved. It turns out there's a difference uh, as far as the kinds of workloads you're doing. Are you transferring like a huge chunk of data or just a lot of really small chunks uh, all over the hard drive? The big chunk of data is called sequential. And if you have a lot of small chunks all over the drive, that's random. And as you can guess, if you have sequential transfers, you get close to the max transfer rate of 125 megabytes per second. If you have a lot of chunks all over the hard drive, it's the performance is degraded quite a bit. So your throughput will be about less than a megabyte per second if you have small pieces of data all over. Definitely depends on you know what how big um, those chunks are and how far apart and all of that. But on average, if you it'll be about something like this, less than a megabyte per second. So this is good for if you want to transfer a massive file, then you will have mostly sequential delays. And so that can go pretty close to the max transfer rate in either case. And then if you have a database where you have tiny records spread out over a little uh, piece parts of the disk all over the hard drive, then you're much more likely to get this kind of throughput, less than a megabyte per second. So different tasks will have different throughputs, depending on the kind of workload you're talking about. Okay, so we'll stop here, and then we'll continue with uh, scheduling in the next video.